What's poppin' gamers? Welcome back to the eighth iteration of the Nifty Cauldron. Eight is my favorite number, hashtag the infinite. Um, but welcome back to the eighth iteration of the Nifty Cauldron. Uh, I am a host here, and my name is Kelly Finger Guns, and this is my co-host. It's Milan. Coincidentally, my favorite number is six. Uh, six is also a good number, especially when you get three of them lined up. And now we have a special guest today. And uh, everybody, welcome to the pod, Scott. Scott. Hello. Hello, Scott. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing today, Milan? I'm good. Good. Just chilling. Vibing. After I got done vibing with the boys last night, now I'm vibing in the pod. It's all good. But yeah, welcome, Scott. Glad, uh, glad you could be here. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, uh, Scott. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself so that uh, the podcast get you know get to know you, the listeners. So I am a fan of both Kelly and Milan. Um, they are both content creators on Twitch, obviously, and I follow both of them. Uh, sub where I can, and I just enjoy uh, the community and just being friends with these guys. Um, uh, and they've been great. A uh, great amount of help is as well when when playing together in games like Monster Hunter. Obviously, Milan has all the knowledge, and Kelly has all the charisma. So, you know, it's 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 just been a great time being able to hang out with these guys and and uh, play games with them and and everything. So, yeah. yeah. Are, are you coming back next week? I like this. I, like <laughs> <laughs> I could get used to this. I know my one brain cell is celebrating right now. It's like. <laughs> Give me that serotonin, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here all week, folks. Uh, I love it. I, I actually want to jump right into it. Um, with your peculiar comment of sub when I can. Uh, so that seems a little bit sus. That's a lie. <laughs> uh, history has shown <laughs> that you've gifted a lot of subs to Apothecary. Is that because... Uh, so I guess first question... Do you do that to a lot of streamers? I've gift bombed uh, several streamers in the past. Uh, yes, I find that especially in these times, um, you know, being late twenty twenty, everything and the climate of everything going on in the world, that uh, it just doing something nice for people. Uh, it really goes an extra extra mile at this point, um, and just being able to see people smile or show you know show my appreciation towards them. Uh, where I can and when I can. Uh, everyone knows Kelly for her dimples, and it's absolutely awesome whenever I see those things like shoot up towards Mars. You know, they they, they recede so far into her face. You know, it's 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 just this this uh, really good feeling that you get knowing that uh, that you've essentially you know contributed something nice to someone else for the day. So that's just kind of my thinking behind it when I do it. But uh, also, I mean, I just really enjoy you know. The, the content and the entertainment that, that the both of you put out or well specifically Kelly in, in this context but uh, yeah yeah it's it's just a good little gesture that, that I like to do to help other people feel better so okay so it's not like certain criteria like if a streamer has XYZ or does XYZ on stream it's like or, or has a certain community that doesn't trigger it's just kind of a spur of the moment kind of thing is that is that accurate to say I mostly contribute to smaller uh, content creators on Twitch. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily, you know, sub bomb, you know, people that have thousands of viewers, concurrent viewers, you know, during a stream. Um, and it's not for like the sake. It's it's not for like the sake of attention. Um, it's just you know, I I feel like, especially on Twitch now, you know, with everything that's going on in in the world, you know, that a lot of people are flocking to Twitch to try and, and see if there's a career there, see if there's an opportunity there. Uh, for them to, you know, try and secure some additional income or, you know, just to be able to, uh, you know, put out a, a funny, you know, entertaining stream for people. Uh, everybody has their motives, but I find that I feel like I have more of an impact on uh, the smaller streamers out there and hoping to boost them is to whatever, you know, through whatever means that I have available to me uh, to try and help them become more successful. That's kind of my general goal. Uh, larger streamers don't need my help they're already there yeah that's that's very true but it's a very admirable thing that you're doing 
Yeah. Uh, hats off, dude. Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. And like, just to, just to like also touch on that, it's like, like, I feel it's goop. Like when, you know, I get gifted subs and stuff like that. Like, yeah, I smile. Like it does, it does bring me joy. It gives, you know, and it's, it's a nice way to get like feedback specifically from the community. Just being like, Hey, you know, like you're doing a good job enough for me to like, want to introduce other people to come to you. Cause a lot of people, come back to the stream if they've been gifted a sub because they're like, oh, who is this person again? And then they come back and they watch. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, if anything, it's like a little bit of, I mean, it's a lot of bit of promotion, you know, just for like you see, you know, you get a notification from Twitch saying you got a gifted sub from for this streamer. You go back and you want to check it out and be like, oh, yeah, you know, maybe I'll hang out here for a while. So, um, you know, thank you, Scott, for making me smile and having such a um, genuine, like, love and care for the Twitch community. I think that, um, you know, that's, it's something very special and to be treasured. So thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and one other thing that kind of stood out thinking about this as well, uh, especially in, in Kelly's case with her stream recently, uh, she kind of found like a, a niche sort of uh, community revolving around the game Monster Hunter World. And you know, a lot of a lot of streamers today, you know, they, they struggle to try and find that one thing that makes them unique or makes, you know, try, tries to bring back viewers from the previous stream, you know, and one thing that Kelly's managed to do recently that I'm that I'm, I'm really intrigued by and I'm really happy to see that it's working out well for you is just your Monster Hunter World community that, that you've started. Um, I mean, you've discussed this in previous podcasts, but. Uh, and I don't mean to rehash too much, but you've you've managed to find a sort of way to interact with your community more through the game. You know, countless people have have bought the game even a second time so that they could play on PC with the community. I mean, I've in just in the last month, I think I've played with at least a dozen strangers that I've never met before. Um, and surprisingly, I've not had one bad encounter in any of it. Um, I mean, there's, there, there wasn't one night where, you know, I got out of the game and I thought to myself, uh, you know, this, this guy sauce or, you know, the, there's, there's always one bad apple. No, in this case, it's really, truly, there is no bad apple. Um, it's, it's, it's just been a great experience. So that's also something that I, that I like to promote and encourage and support. Uh, but yeah, that, that was another, that's, that's another factor that I think it makes it a lot easier for me to be able to, uh, show my support towards kelly but well thank you <laughs> again i really appreciate it and um i had no idea that like monster hunter was just going to take off because to be fair when i when i initially started playing monster hunter i was doing it because i was like man i really want to play monster hunter and like um i want to play you know because i got to get through iceborne because i never got through iceborne and like i specifically bought initially bought monster hunter because i wanted to play with Milan. And so I very much realized that like, hey, I still am sitting on this Iceborne content and I need to like fucking get through this with like the person that I bought the game to play it with. So then, yeah, Milan was like, okay, well, let's go. And then I, for, you know, it was the game that was really interesting me at that time, maybe for selfish reasons, who knows? We will allude to them. It'll be a, like a trail of breadcrumbs, but I really wanted to play Monster Hunter. And I was like, well, I could stream this and you know hopefully people will like it too and maybe they'll want to play with me and that's kind of like where i i, I kind of got the idea for it for the most part and then um you know having uh, accessibility for you know monster hunter lobbies to be you know like 16 people you know once i finished the the core content of iceborne i was like yeah you know we could just open up the lobbies and then you know if people needed help with like a certain quest you know then we could just join you know they i could join on them and then you know help them out or they could join on me and help me help me out and it just kind of like went from there but i was actually really truly and honestly surprised how much support that i got for monster hunter just because i know that typically that's not the game that i usually play on stream i usually play you know like otomes or narrative or puzzle games and stuff and like chats kind of talking to me about you know solving puzzles or you know like the, the what's going on and like narrative wise so when i switched over to an action game i was kind of like a little worried that like oh man maybe people won't be into it but then i was actually like very pleasantly surprised that so many people went and they're like yeah you know this game looks sick and then they bought the game and then they started playing it and then now they're like oh i'm gonna level up and catch up to you and then, i don't know it just felt really good like i was like wow Maybe, maybe, maybe they are here for me, you know, <laughs> or 
something. I don't fucking know. I mean, yeah. Um, like the the support Monster Hunter got was like people got too into it almost. <laughs> you know, it's like oh the puzzle. Yeah, it's like oh the puzzle is how do we how do we kill the monster the quickest? Let's go, team. Um, so yeah, like I remember we never even talked about viewer lobbies or even took it into consideration that people might start picking up the game and i was like holy shit like a lot of people are into it let's let's make it a thing um unfortunately this is i'm gonna join some some bad news here for a second uh monster hunter rise is going back to the old monster hunter uh lobbies uh for player only oh no and no. It'll, and I mean, I think this part is good. Uh, some people might disagree. Uh, let me know in the comments if you do, uh, so I can flame you for it. Um, it's 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 gonna separate village and guild quests again. So you'll have an offline story and then an online uh, quote unquote story, which I think is great personally because I like doing the village first. All right. Wow. Good to know. Yeah, that's that. That's a little disappointing <laughs> to hear that. It's a bit of a bummer, like specifically for 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 me, I would say. Yeah, I'm fascinated at how Capcom has really found a, a, a market for that sort of MMO appeal, but it's not an MMO. You know, you're not running by hundreds of people that are sitting there idle at their keyboards. You know, like you would in like an MMO. You know, it's very isolated into its system and everything, and it almost feels like they. That they're just one step one step away from being able to go full MMO and they never really they never take the plunge and it kind of I mean it's it's disappointing for me unfortunately that that, that that they aren't willing to take it that extra step because it seems like the they're, they're almost there but they just can't seem to want to go full MMO I think um this is, I don't think there'll ever be a monster on MMO because one Monster Hunter Online got shut down last year because it just wasn't making them any more money, I guess. Uh, to be fair, Monster Hunter Online was limited to the sea region, Southeast Asia and Japan. So maybe it would have done better if it had actual, an actual translation stuff in the West. But I don't think they could just figure it out. Like in general, like how would you do an MMO uh, to hunt a monster, right? Like do you just make an HP sponge or... Like what do you do? And I think this is this is the closest thing we'll ever get. If if anything, um, the changes to the online lobbies and some other changes that I've heard and read about uh, about Rise since last week, it solidifies it solidifies it for me that they're treating this as a handheld uh, Monster Hunter release and not like a mainline uh, title. Yeah, that's what I'm feeling too. Um, as for like um, you know MMOs. Uh, I can I can see like it it does like have like a that bit of you know online interaction and like camaraderie and stuff like that. But if Monster Hunter was an MMO, I probably would not play it just because I am not an MMO person. I've never been into MMOs. I just I don't know. I just never could really get into them. I tried. I think the longest one that I was into was Black Desert Online, and that's really only because I could train horses. And I was like, hell yeah, I'm gonna have the have the, the most bitchin fucking horse in this bitch, right? But um, so I've never really been into MMOs for the most part. Um, but I mean, I do really like Monster Hunter, and I can see what you're saying, where you know, like it's definitely got like the feeling of MMOs, where it's like you know, you're getting essentially shiny your shoes to kick bigger rocks. Which yeah, is what Monster <laughs> Hunter is is like you you kill the dude, so then you can get his skin and wear it, and then kill the next dude up, kind of thing. Um, and that's pretty much like the, I don't know, the, the big kind of standby with um, with MMOs is like you got to get geared and then you got to go and then you got to go fuck that shit up. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I've never really been into MMOs, but then now that I'm looking at it and it's like Monster Hunter World does kind of have like a little bit of that formulaic get China shoes to keep bigger rocks. And now I'm kind of like, why do I like it in comparison to the <laughs> traditional MMO? But I do. But at the end of the day, you don't need the shiny shoes to kick the bigger rock. At the end of the day, like if you want to, for the most part, you know, uh, you could you could hunt naked with with just your weapon, right? Like you don't you don't have to get the shinier shoes, and it's also just a variety of things, right? Like typically in an MMO fashion, you like farm 
the current patch in game content. And Monster Hunter, uh, you know, I mean, obviously now with Fatalis out, that's that, that's the best gear and you do that. But if you think back to end of world, base world, because that's where you played more end game, we hunted a variety of monsters all the time, right? Like I would say like five to nine monsters regularly, uh, just whatever investigations and stuff came up. So I, I think I think that's just the main appeal, right? To uh it's, it's it's diverse enough and the grind isn't so painful where you're yeah. like MMO wise grinding potentially for weeks or months for that one elusive gear drop that'll boost your yeah. DPS by by two percent. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. And I and I think that's that's probably where that's probably where I draw the line. Like I love min maxing. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm a big slut for min maxing. Like, give me a fire emblem game and I will I will figure out a way to fucking break it because I love that shit. But yeah, I don't know. Just I, I think that's what it is. It's like the, it's like the, it's like I don't want to do that amount of work only to get like point two something. So I'm like a better rogue on this like fucking WoW server or some shit. Like that's like shit. I don't give a fuck about. Like I'm slow jerking right now into the camera, but you can't see it because you're listening to a podcast. But I'm doing it. The <laughs> appeal for Monster Hunter is really interesting. The 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 appeal for me revolves back to the very first time that I ever even heard of Monster Hunter. And this would have been back in 2010 or 2011. My cousin contacted me. Um, he he was a hobbyist game developer as a kid. And he he messaged me one day. He's like, hey, there's this game coming out on the Wii called Monster Hunter 3 or Try, I believe it it was spelt on the, on the box art at least. But um, he said that it, he pitched it as an MMO, but instead of uh, mashing the number buttons on your keyboard you actually have to fight the monsters you don't just sit there and press one and then press two and then press three and watch things die you have to like duck d and duck dive dip and dodge around these monsters and to be able to do it or to, to to be able to fight and and be successful you know you actually have to be good at the game and you actually have to have a reaction time and things like that and so that was the appeal for me was you know uh, mmos i agree i can't really justify the time investment necessary to get into them um at least not anymore but monster hunter kind of gives you that little itch where for an hour you can just escape and fight a monster and before you know it you get the 10 minute warning and you, you didn't even realize that you've been you know playing for the past 50 minutes and then at the end of it you know you have the perfect stopping point every single time you come back from a fight you don't feel you know it, it doesn't have that sort of addiction that mmos have where you feel like you have to grind for the next month just to get this new updates gear that just came out just so you can be at, at the top of the you know leaderboards or whatever it doesn't have that sort of grindy appeal to it which i really appreciate yeah, yeah. and i would also say um it's it's definitely up there in terms of difficulty. Like as a game series, you know, like people always say uh, Dark Souls and Demon Souls and, you know, Soulsborne series, they are definitely difficult, but I would I would definitely add Monster Hunter up there as well. So for a lot of gamers, it just provides that, that little challenge, like in its own little bubble, because I wouldn't say other than Monster Hunter-like games, uh, the skills you get in Monster Hunter, they don't translate to anything else. And they're very unique and exclusive to monster hunter but it's definitely its own challenge and with that comes its own reward because it feels very satisfying like it felt super fucking satisfying to kill fatalis after an entire failed stream to come back like do a little bit of prep work and then just do it first try like that felt really good and very few games uh let you like climb the wall like that and just overcome it yeah i can definitely feel that for sure absolutely um, yeah um getting over the hurdle you know um sometimes and sometimes you like you just have to like stop and take a break like, have you ever been like fucking grinding on a game real fucking hard and you get to like that boss and you like can't fucking get your hands to fuck you can't get your hands to fuck like your hands are not fucking at all they are not even in the realm of fuck and so you take the time off you know and you're just like okay i'm just gonna stop and come back to it and usually what if i stop and i come back to it i'm able to beat it so i feel like you got that, you know, Scoob, like a little bit with your Fatalis thing where you're just like, you know, I just got to take a little break ski and like you did a little prep work and then you came back and you butt fucked it. So good job. Yeah, I mean, it was it was 100 percent the prep I did. Don't get me wrong. Like I, I went back to the drawing boards and uh, augmented my armor for more defense, like slotted in some very specific skills. 
and it was definitely that but it that is that's also rewarding in its own way right because um i could have tried to unga bunga like keep running into him until eventually maybe i'll i'll edge out a win or just take that step back analyze what how, how, what the fight is like and what might like you know edge me over to to that win and uh that's exactly what happened so i definitely feel you on that and, and also even when you do step away from uh monster hunter you're not missing out like you know like because an mmo is built to kind of make you have to log in every single day so you're min maxing and you're not losing out on your daily quests and you know your weekly raids and everything like that if i don't play monster hunter for a year or five years and i come back like i'm not behind the curve so to speak obviously a little bit if someone has been playing for five years straight but at the end of the day um i don't have to like grind too much to like beat the story or like catch up to the latest content patch and uh, things of that nature so it's definitely um it's it, it's a game built with that in mind right especially if you think back to um to to how how to how people in japan work like they work like 80 hour weeks their business life is insane uh so a lot of them play on like the psp and the ds like they they all love to play games on the on the train commute home and to work so i i think monster Hunter is kind of like built with that in mind right because a good hunt is about 10 minutes right so it's very easy to just pick up do a quick hunt while you're going to work or from work or during a small break and then just continue like it's it's incremental progress if you uh need it to be that way if your your work life is structured that way you know yeah and one thing that uh I thought about this last night when I was actually playing. Um, one thing that Capcom has not done, and I have infinite amounts of appreciation for them to not go this route with their games, uh, where other MMOs pretty much build their entire business model around it. Sometimes is you you briefly touched on it there. The acronym for it is FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, a lot of MMOs really capitalize on the fear of missing out um some examples you know mmos will have timed events that are only available you know if it's like a seasonal events are kind of like a very broad term for that it's it's, it's not the best example um one that comes to mind if uh for any of the, the the listeners out there if you've ever played a game like warframe warframe was known for its fear of missing out there would be things where uh certain things would happen on one day every two weeks and if you weren't there for that one day, if you had anything going on that one day and you couldn't get on, you had to wait till the next two weeks to, to do it. And even then, what, you know, two weeks from now, it's going to be completely different than it is during that one event. So, you know, a lot of businesses kind of build their models around this fear of missing out. And Capcom has not done that. And the, the thing that made me think about this was the, the Argosi in the game down in the trade yard in Selena or Celiana, I'm sorry, or however it's pronounced, the, the main town. And uh, they they show up every couple of rounds and then you can go to them and, and you can pay, you know, with your points to, to get whatever you've requested the previous time they were there. You know, if, if, if they were to take the FOMO approach, the fear of missing out approach, the Argosi would only appear like once every week to, to try and get you in the game to, to, to you know, get what the Argosi's, you know, selling to you. But for these, for Capcom, they're like, no, we're just going to make it available like every three or four fights. And then, you know, so they, they don't really use that as their business model. And I have so much appreciation that they don't do that because it really does incentivize a lot of, a lot of irresponsible behavior. I, I feel, um, you know, when, when, when MMOs and big games try to use the fear of missing out, but yeah, that's just something that uh, I thought about with Capcom the other night that I really appreciate about their games. Yeah. I'll, I'll even add on to that. Um, world is I'm pretty sure the only title that has event quests rotate in and out normally how it's been, uh, for every handheld and every mainline other other one and monster monster Hunter rise is also confirmed to be this way uh normally when you download when you when there's an event quest uh you log in you download it to your system and it's available to you until the end of time because um they, they have the approach is like well 
most players are playing handheld, so they might not be connected to the internet at all times. So let's give them an option to just download the quest so they can play it at their own leisure. Uh, Monster Hunter World is, to my knowledge, the only one that has like rotating event quests because it's built for all the consoles, so you can't like play it on the go anyway. And yeah, it's definitely... Um, they kind of know their audience, right? I, I, I think at the end of the day, they do focus a little bit too much on the Japanese audience. Uh, like, I think a lot of Western gamers uh, have different needs, I want to say, right? Because um, uh, our, our, our work structure isn't built where you're expected to work 12 hours a day, six, seven days a week like they are. So... We typically get through content like a lot quicker like we we just consume content like like done like in a day like we we always want more because because we have a lot more time to play stuff um so i think i'm i'm interested to see how that's going to affect the next mainline monster hunter because uh rise is absolutely being treated as 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 a handheld uh game so i'm giving that that one kind of a pass because they're really, I guess, I don't know if, if market research has shown it, but I guess a lot of people play their Switch in handheld mode, like outside of the house. And I'm like, who who are you people? You know, I, I can't relate to that. I I don't think I've ever done that. Uh, mine's just always docked and I play it on the TV. Uh, I know Kelly's raising her hand, which you guys can't see, but are you, pl but are you like playing it somewhere or are you just bringing it to a friend and playing playing it that way? Um, so I like to primarily play my Switch like dead ass in my bed. I just wanna <laughs> I play in my bed okay, with my sure. fucking switch in my hand and shit. I don't wanna fucking look at my TV and stuff. And like the angle of my TV is also awkward for me to play in bed anyways. But I mean, yeah. So um but I recently just made it so then I could use my second monitor as like a TV for my desk. So maybe I'll start doing that more often. But I do like to play my Switch primarily on the go. Like I do like I'll take it to my parents house so then when you know like my parents are doing when i finish you know the resetting the router because the internet you know breaks as, as they like to say when i finish uh resetting the router and then like i'm just there for the next you know x amount of time before my mom you know inevitably decides to give me food because she's a, she's an asian lady that's a pie pusher um i like to you know have something to do while i'm just trying to chill in or whatever um, so I'll usually take my switch over to like my parents' house or to like a friend's house, you know, when we when, when we did like this big fucking um Mario Party tournament. Uh your girl plays second. But um we did like a Mario Party tournament or whatever, and I saw so I, I you know, like I took my switch over and brought my like my Joy Cons and stuff. Like it's it's primarily like the the thing that I take to other people's houses. Like I definitely am not gonna like load up my fucking PS4 for some games, my brother, you know. Like, um, not to say that I'm beyond the LAN party because I fuck with LAN parties and I have taken my whole ass PC to fucking go to a LAN party. But I'm just saying, like, typically, like, yeah, I, I play my Switch on the go, my guy. I think you're just a little a little bit of a special case, Milan. Um, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't classify your situation as on the go. Like, the bed, eh, you know, like, the, the, I, I'll, I'm not I'm not even going to count that because you're still at home, right? Like, you just, because you you're... <laughs> I mean, you said your bed. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> but no. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely see, you know, like when you're going to your parents or something like that. But I think, like, ultimately, like, uh, you know, for the Mario Mario, Par Mario Party tournament, if the Switch wasn't portable, everybody would have probably just brought their console, I imagine. Because in this day and age, most people have a car... I don't, but in America, it's, it's like 99% of people have a car. So I don't think like bringing your, your consoles to someone else's house. I, I would say the limiting factor is the amount of TVs, if anything, you know, and not so much the weight of a console, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I see what you're saying. But I mean, think about it. East Coasters, a lot of East Coasters do not have a fucking car. People that grew up like specifically in like New York because of the subway system. It's like you don't really need a car. Like I think sure. like one of the fucking one of the fucking news articles today was just like Lady Gaga finally got her driver's license at 30 years old. And it's just kind of like, yeah, see, and it's only she got one because she moved here to fucking L.A. where you can't not have a car because our public transit system is fucking shit. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot but of then, 
but would you play a switch in the new york subway would you take that risk i don't know i've never been to new york i can't really vouch for that um scott do you want to dox your reasoning at this point because i i feel like as a as a resident east coaster that you could provide like more clarity on the subject as far as the getting around part uh, i would completely agree with you i've known plenty of people in the baltimore area where if their entire life revolves around the city which it is perfect it's big enough that it's you're perfectly capable of pretty much living your life and never really leaving those big cities uh it's very uh simple to just not have a car and just bicycle wherever you want to go or walk um and yeah it's it's not at all uncommon but as far as especially today you know in today's age you know going out and you know setting up your your switch on a picnic table somewhere with a bunch of friends sitting around it not really a thing right now um but i can't say that i've ever i i have seen people out and about um and it's it's not at all uncommon but I don't think the idea of a bunch of people gathering around, uh, you know, in, in public to, you know, play on a small switch screen together is, is a very common thing. Uh, you know, the, the, the advertisements that you see when the switch first came out, you know, they were really promoting the whole idea of getting your friends together and, and, uh, you know, everybody playing together and that kind of aged like milk when a pandemic comes in and comes around, but yeah, so definitely, uh, not having a car is not at all uncommon so is seeing switches out in public but having like a a local party with a bunch of friends you know standing around with a couple joy cons in their hand is you know playing smash on a you know in a public park somewhere that's i i've yet to see anything close to that anywhere <laughs> but also would you feel comfortable riding a new york subway playing a switch oh as far as ah. I've only been to New York a couple times. Um, I have been on the subway system there, and I could see it. I I don't know that I would personally feel comfortable doing that, just because I tend to be on the alert side when I'm just out and about in crowded areas, um, and that that would be obviously very distracting for me. But I definitely could see other people doing it on the subway. I haven't been to New York since the switch came out so i couldn't verify either way but i could certainly see people doing that gotcha i could never like if i'm riding public transport i'm always already worried what if i'm holding my phone like what if somebody just comes in snatches it and runs out just right as the door closes like what do i do so i definitely want to want to want to do that with a switch but that might just be me uh i don't know like let me know in the comments if anyone can relate to that feeling of just the scenario of just someone Literally, like, snatching your shit, like, the second before the doors close and just running out. And that's it. It's gone forever. Sure. Yeah. But also, if you um, are somebody that play your fucking Switch on the New York subway, dock yourself below. We would love to hear about it. <laughs> or, if, if you don't want to out yourself, uh, just, just just leave a like on the video. Like, that's fine. That works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just drop that like. Let us know through, through, through that polling system. Um... I, I want to like hella circle back for a second. I've been I've been burning on this question for, like half an hour now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Scott, to go back to, to the sub gifting. Have you ever had, had like a bad experience with someone where they just like didn't really react? Or like, oh, hey, thanks for the gifted subs and just moved on or just didn't even like care or just a bad experience where maybe they even like called you out because they thought it was fake or anything like that i assume i hope i hope not um well come to find oh, no. out uh when you wave around large amounts of cash in front of streamers and offer it to them they tend to react rather well to that um the i guess and i wouldn't even really consider this like a bad reaction but you know yeah. You know, so sometimes if, if they're in the middle of something, um, it's justifiable that, you know, they, they, they wouldn't necessarily, you know, want to, you know, be distracted, you know, to, to have to say read off, you know, 20 new subscriber names or anything like that. So, you know, maybe, maybe you don't get this, you know, thrilling reaction that, you know, some people might expect from streamers when you, you know, gift bomb, you know, a bunch of subs. But for me, that's not really, um, 
that's definitely not what drives me uh, to do it. So my expectations are, are very low to begin with, but at least in Kelly's case, I, I think last time I checked, I'm up to around 20 some gift subs, I think is, is the last number that flashed across uh, when I, when I uh, gifted some subs, but you know, when, when it's that high of a volume, it's pretty impossible to not get a reaction. So, <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I was just wondering, cause I can't really imagine, especially when, cause you said, you know, small streamers, uh, are, are more your go-to audience that they would like react badly or poorly. Well, I was just, you know, just curious about it. If anything, I would say the, the the bad reactions that i that i do see are never from the streamers obviously because you're gifting them subs it's actually if anything the toxic responses actually oftentimes come from chat members themselves um and you know of course you know no one's really gonna you know say anything that, that, that could really make me go ah eh, you know because i'm not here to support the twitch chat i'm here to support the streamer but, you know, sometimes some Twitch members will get a little cocky or, you know, something like that, uh, you know, for whatever reason, you know, maybe they're having a bad day or something. But uh, that's never really stopped me from yeah. having a, from wanting to give to a to a streamer, because like I said, I'm there for I'm there to, to support the streamer and be entertained by the streamer. Less Twitch chat. Yeah, like um, I've noticed that before in like other people's chats where someone will do like a gift bomb and like chat will become like weirdly not like toxic but like kind of like a backhanded compliment like yes they will say something um you know like they'll they'll make like an assumption of the of the gift bomb person they're like oh you know like obviously you know you know dennis 65 is a fucking oil prince you know and they'll like say something like weird and like you're just like okay well, what the fuck does that add to this conversation like kind of thing and it's like it's kind of like a weird backhanded compliment and i just don't really understand it like it's like why can't you just be happy for that person like i don't know if it comes from a place of say something like jealousy or if it's just uh you know feeling as though you know, someone comes in with big dick energy and just drops, you know, 50 subs on someone, you know, and someone else can't necessarily do that. So that makes them feel less, even though it doesn't, even though it shouldn't. Yeah. But it's maybe like, that's something. Yeah. Like you support in every way, in any, not every way, but like in any way that you can. <laughs> not every way. Blood from the stone, you know, you know what I'm saying? The like, Lord God. Jesus. Exactly. Like, so. Yeah. The, I mean, the, 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 there's the elephant in, in the room in this conversation, which is that, you know, some could potentially argue that the whole reason why I'm on this podcast right now is because I was, you know, gifted so many subs to Kelly. Um, and, you know, that I may, may perhaps, you know, receive preferential treatment, so to speak, because of those gifted subs. But really, uh, the, I guess my defense for that would be that it's my charming personality <laughs> you know uh may, maybe that has something to do with it but you know that's that's yeah. that, that, that's a total you know cop out answer but i mean also at the same time yeah that's the reason why it's because like you're a really cool dude and like we've played like games together on stream we played the games uh games together off stream we had our first interactions like through like a community night and then i was like okay yeah like you seem cool and it's like if everybody wants to come in for me and be like oh yeah you like you give preferential treatments like i give preferential treatment to fucking ariel dude like <laughs> what else do you want from me <laughs> like and, and it's and it's not necessarily preferential treatment it's just like you know you you vibe with that person well enough where you're just like yeah you know i'd love to do to, to like hang out and stuff and like i don't know I thought, yeah, I think it's a good time. I think it's a good time. And I stand by my decision. If ever, anybody else has a fucking problem with that, you can lick my nuts. Um, for, for a second, when you said, uh, you know, uh, that you agree with that reason, I thought you were just going to confirm. Oh, yeah, no, that, that's why he's here. Uh, but <laughs> to also like nip it in a bud. That is not uh, why why Scott will be here, because I have a say in this, too. Right. And I do not because I mean Scott doesn't give me any subs, so <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you make it so difficult for me, Nifty. Yeah, I know. we're gonna ignore it. I'm not feeling yet, but no, like, that, that for anyone wondering it, you know, and who's gonna like comment down below, like simp, like stop. It's not 
Like, it's got his hair because he's a cool dude. We all vibe together. He has a great voice. Just he's appreciate. Got a sexy ass voice. Yeah. I just like you appreciate like what we're getting. Be on their pod. <laughs> exactly. The other thing that came to mind is uh, part of the reason why I enjoy this community and, and, and try to make myself more friendly and approachable and everything is just that, you know, it's, I, I keep going back to, to, you know, the times that we live in and everything, but, you know, I, I generally just try to make it my goal to just get along with everybody. I don't, you know, try to form clicks with the streamers or, or with Milan or Calgary or Ariel, or, you know, Chris or a, anyone else. You know, I just like to be approachable. I like to enjoy my time spent with other people. Uh, I like to escape from all the bad news that's going on out in the world. So I just kind of make it my sort of personal goal to just be liked, to just be a likable person um, and try and, you know, just be, you know, be happy, you know, for, you know, for a night with other people. So that's just kind of my general goal. And I tend to find from like a personal perspective People tend to like you a lot more when you're willing to just compliment someone for, you know, small things or you're willing to put yourself out there and just be nice and helpful. You know, whether that be, you know, we were talking about how Monster Hunter World brought in so many new players in, in Kelly's community. Uh, one of the benefits of that is, is we literally have, I think we probably brought in it. I, I played, like I said, with upwards of a dozen people from all different uh, points in the game. Some had just started, some are in end game at the end of Iceborne. And uh so being able to have so many different people you know I, I can easily just jump in if i just want to get my fix for a quick fight or two you know i can jump in and help out some of the lower people and the game incentivizes me to do that it gives me trade-in items that i can sell for a butt ton of cash in game which is really nice but just being able to just put myself out there and just be friendly and, and willing to help others i find that that goes a long ways social interactions yeah just like putting out the good energy, right? Because I, yeah. I have a similar philosophy. Um, I generally treat people how I want to be treated, and that seems to work. <laughs> you know, like yeah. I like think I'm a I'm a good guy who who, who likes to help people. Uh, sometimes a little too much, uh, but that's like a dark story. So that that doesn't fit the current vibes of of the podcast. So let's not let's not we'll go into that, that. For after dark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've we've entered a dark we've entered a a, a dark uh, a dark route right now. Yeah, so so let's <laughs> let, let's like go back to like you know the yellow brick road that that doesn't lead this way. <laughs> um, so, so one oh hmm? I'm sorry, uh, Kelly. One question for you. Um, you've mentioned this in a previous podcast, I, I believe, towards the beginning actually. So it's been a couple of weeks now. Uh, it's actually been I think over a month that you've been playing Monster Hunter regularly on stream and with friends, and. Uh, before it was always, it, it was, it, you mentioned how it was difficult to gauge the impact that Monster Hunter World has had on your stream and the people that have, that have started playing because you've, you know, cultivated this community. Have you noticed any, uh, significant gains or any, any fluctuation in, in your, in your stream statistics as, as far as, you know, are, are viewers dipping because they're playing the game or have viewers been going up, you know? What, what impact has this game had on your stream as far as your success? Uh, yeah, so weirdly enough, um, my viewership has either um, stayed pretty much the same or it has gone up just ever so slightly. If people are playing, they still actually have my stream up and they kind of have it in another window. So they are there, they're lurking, you know, and so, you know, I get the I get the view on that. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, they're, they're still playing in game and stuff. So uh the only thing I have noticed is that chat interaction has gone down, but that's because, you know, they're playing. Yep. Okay. Interesting. Chat is just the biggest uh, casualty in uh, Monster Hunter streams. <laughs> yeah, because I feel like the success of a streamer is built off of their interaction with chat. And Monster Hunter just seems like the perfect game. Uh, streamers, especially ones that, you know, upcoming streamers that, you know, w want to find a way to, you know, have a community around their stream, you know, getting people to play this sounds like a, a great way to actually do that. And therefore, you know, trying to and, and boost your success on Twitch. And I, I was just curious if the, if the impact that, the, that it's had on you as a streamer, which it sounds like it's, it's, it's been a net positive all around, which is, which yeah, is great I, to hear. I would a hundred percent say it's been a net positive. Um, for getting people to, to play the game, my biggest thing was I was worried that people would say it's too hard. 
because that's most of the feedback that I get from a lot of my friends is that, um, you know, I spent some time with um, somebody recently and I was like, yeah, you know, I want to like, I want to play Monster Hunter kind of thing. Are you going to get Rise? And then um, she was very transparent with me and she was like, you know what? Probably not because the last time I tried to play Monster Hunter Try, it was too hard for me and I, I couldn't get into it. So maybe I'll borrow your game and see if I like it. And then if I like it, then I'll buy it. But a lot of like what basically Milan said earlier is like, it's, it's skill intensive gameplay. Like you can't be like, you have, you have to eventually, you can't just kind of skate on like being like, okay at the game. Like, especially when you get up to master rank, you actually have to like command like a little bit of an ability. Otherwise, like you're not going to be able to like, kill the monsters or you you know like if you don't have a good sense of like when the monster is going to be doing this like this is a good time for me to go over here and like heal and like if you don't if you if your brain isn't thinking in that kind of way then the game will never click for you and so i'm not saying that like no one can play this game it's only for the god gamers or anything like that but i will say like what i the most feedback i've heard from other people getting into monster hunter is that they've told me it's too hard and then they give up yeah, it certainly is a skill-based game. Um, it takes a certain, you know, mindset to really get into that sort of a thing. But, uh, you know, uh, as we find out, you know, with with this difficulty of with, with the difficulty of Monster Hunter World, it just makes it that much more rewarding. Our, we do actually see visible gains in your skill. Uh, you know, where you know earlier in the day you were having problems and you were three times and you had to go back in wasting an hour of your time maybe you laid on the floor you know and just you know gave up on life for an hour but then when you finally do get back into it you you know and, and, and you actually beat it that sense of reward is is, is just it, it's everything it feels great you know to be able to finally overcome that because you realize that you just got good <laughs> um, yeah 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 absolutely like and as far as getting into it um probably already said this on one of the previous Monster Hunter episodes. Um, Monster Hunter World is the easiest to get into, not because, not only because of some of the changes where you can heal when you're moving around and stuff like that. It's just in general, it's the easiest uh, Monster Hunter so far. Um, like a big, a big, a big, big thing why it's easy, I guess, now that I think about it is. Um, you can craft items on the fly without opening your menu. You can just use the radio menu and you can just bring seven fucking max potions. Just craft on the fly and just get that IV drip into your veins of that juicy goodness that is healing. Uh, so if if there was ever, you know, a good one to, to get into it, um, Monster Hunter World is definitely the one because uh, Rise, like I said, is going back to village and guild quests. Uh, I would I wouldn't say village is hard. It's just a solo campaign, and guild quests like the online portion, it it'll probably scale very quickly. Um, how it was, I think even in try, like offline, like three four star quests are typically like uh, guild online like one stars. So it scales up very very quickly because they built they they're under the assumption of like hey, you should have already. Uh, done offline first so if anyone's interested in monster hunter world is the best place to to jump into and uh then the rest then the community can just call you call call, call you like a fucking uh, world lit for, for the rest of the time <laughs> yeah and i think that actually is a is, is a good segue or pivot uh another discussion just basically um you know when you guys aren't playing monster hunter uh what else are you playing at this point what do you mean we're not playing Monster Hunter? What do you mean? Uh, <laughs> well, so Milan's no, kidding. For, kidding. for for any of the listeners that are maybe coming in for the first time on this podcast and, and hearing this, Milan is a top tier uh end game player. It is he, he's the he's the kind of person that will come in and and criticize, you know, how you're doing everything wrong, but he does it in the most tactful and approachable way that makes you go oh he's 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 not being condescending or anything he's actually trying to help i mean he's he's like top tier end game player so just just so we're clear <laughs> he's he he doesn't play anything else i'm sure but kelly are, are there any other games <laughs> that that you're uh that you're playing on the side or anything that you're looking at or interested in playing yeah so 
one i just wanted to touch on that it's like he will be tactful and like critique how you're playing unless you're me and then he'll just tell you that you're shit and tell you <laughs> <laughs> but we also have like a long-standing friendship so that's kind of like the vibe anyways between us it's like you know you're shit you shouldn't have healed there you're dumb <laughs> so and that's kind of like the way that he kind of operates but as for games that i'm hype about right now um yesterday i did a stream of phasmophobia which is the new like ghost hunting game it was a lot of fun i fucking died it was great i loved it um i got some i got some big uh spoopy doop scares like i had one big one where i was like holy shit and like that actually like spooked me and it was good i loved it um but as for new and upcoming games fucking Baldur's gate three dog i was obsessed with Baldur's gate one and two i watched my dad play and then um, when I was in college, I installed it on my laptop and then played it in the back, even though I was supposed to be taking notes and listening in class. But who fucking does that? That's lame. Play video games in class. Don't listen to me. Don't actually do that. Um, uh, take care of your, your schoolwork and uh, be a good kid. Brush your teeth. But um, I am super stoked for Baldur's Gate 3. It looks amazing. Done by the same studio that did Divinity 2. Divinity 2 bucks. If you haven't played Divinity 2, you should fucking get on that shit because it's really good. It's amazing. I love the story. Milan is shaking his head, but it's okay. He's fucking wrong. He can lick my nuts too. But um, <laughs> yeah, I can't wait for Baldur's Gate 3. It looks super good. Um, I actually uh, already got the game. So <laughs> I'm actually looking forward. It's in early access right now. And don't be surprised if on uh, Wednesday I am streaming it, to be honest. <laughs> I'm stoked for it. How about you? Uh, Milan, are you are you down for Baldur's Gate three? You were shaking your head. You had a very in, inflammatory reaction. Yeah. Um. So to get out of there, uh, this is this is gonna bring in dislikes, but that's okay. I didn't like uh, Divinity one or two. I tried them both. Didn't like it. You know, I'm, I'm a huge D and D nerd and a huge D and D buff. I love D and D. Didn't like it. As a kid, I didn't like Baldur's Gate. I forget which one I tried. I will chalk that up to probably my uh, to, to my poor English at the time, like in comparison. That was just like too much reading for my tiny like kid brain to comprehend. Uh, I, I'm not even going to look at Baldur's Gate Tree. I don't care about it. Um, <laughs> instead, uh, I'm currently I started up Final Fantasy 15 for the first time. I'm vibing with the boys. Don't don't raise your finger at me. Don't don't wag that finger. <laughs> How does it feel to be fucking wrong? Just face your demons and be wrong. It feels fucking good because while you're like you know like getting into the deep lore of Baldur's Gate Three, I'm just chilling with the boys or pulling my waifus and like breath of the waifus like Genshin Impact. Just just play that gotcha, dude. For the viewers that can't see, uh, Kelly is visibly personally offended by this. Yeah, uh, she's uh, she's a little bit miffed. I've never seen How her this you? upset. How dare you say <laughs> that shit about fucking Baldur's Gate, Lord and Savior Baldur's Gate? How fucking dare you? What that I don't that I don't care about it? I mean, what what's wrong with that? It's not my type of game. I don't know. I I, I I've never liked those types of RPGs. Like I I I love the lore and the story and that's I'm sure that's all great. I just don't like the combat system, so it's like I can't get into it. Even though again I love D and D, it's it's very similar. <laughs> so I don't know I don't know what what my issue is, Tbh, but it is what it is. C'est la vie. In in Milan's uh, defense here, uh, just how we were talking about how you know Monster Hunter isn't a game for everyone. Uh, I I also have seen people that just didn't get into the Divinity games, um, and they were. Dungeons and Dragons players, you know, through and through these, you know, the, I'm thinking of one particular friend who would play every other Saturday with, you know, local friends, you know, before everything went south in the world. And he just couldn't get into divinity. Um, his reasoning when I asked him about it. Uh, so, uh, for those that don't know, Larian studios, I believe they're a UK based or you're at least somewhere in Europe, uh, based, uh, studio. And they've put up Widely, wildly successful hits uh, divinity original sin and then divinity original sin 2 they've done remasters of them uh very broadly received well for the most part uh one of the big complaints that i heard about the first one that also kind of soured you know my friend's taste of playing the second one was the limited 
options in the dialogue. He felt like, you know, this is a person that's, you know, coming off the backs of, you know, some of Bioware's earlier greatest hits, you know, where, you know, your decision making in the games is really what adds to the immersive experience. And he felt restricted when in the first Divinity game, you were only given one, two, three potential things that you could say in response to something. And oftentimes he found his personality, he couldn't really inject his own personality into the game because he, he, he felt kind of bottlenecked into these decisions that he just didn't agree with to begin with. So that was his biggest complaint. It kind of ruined the immersion for him, but I am a huge fan of both games as well. Uh, I've, I've also played the Baldur's Gate games growing up um, and, and Icewind Dale. Uh, in fact, I played quite a few games growing up some weren't very good even but yeah I've, I've always been a fan of the Baldur's Gate games um they are a bit dated now and I could certainly understand why people may not want to go back and play them they're 30 years old now I think uh ish 25 30 years old somewhere around there so they're old but Larian Studios is by far the most qualified studio that I can think of to make a Baldur's Gate game uh, hands down, uh, they are number one. I can't think of a more qualified studio that has the experience and the, the resume to make a Baldur's Gate game. So I'm very thrilled and looking forward to playing this. Uh, oh, yeah. Like, I'm sure the game is great, you know, for the people that are into that type of stuff. It's just not my cup of tea. That, that's that's all, really. Mm -hmm. And that's all right. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. But at the same time, I do kind of want to make you play Divinity with me. I'll drag <laughs> you kicking and screaming. I, I should have the game. I've I I'm pretty sure I've one of the two. I I think I've Divinity too. Even yeah. And another friend of ours, another mutual friend of ours, also just got it as well. So we could potentially even play with her if if that's something if if that's an option that's uh that that you're considering. But um, yeah, and, I mean I've never run I've never run a four player campaign. I've always just um, played with one other person. But I mean like I'm down. I know I probably need to reinstall it because that game is fucking huge i don't know if you've ever looked at it it's fucking huge it's a fucking huge game and i did want to go back and actually replay it with my dad yeah i mean if this ever happens it wouldn't be it wouldn't be before i beat 15 because that game is also no. fucking huge it's like no, 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 110 no. gigs if anything like i don't even think we need to play it on stream i think we just, just you just need to play it and love i mean it. If I'm going to play it, I'll probably do it on stream because uh, low-key, low I don't know what I'm going to do after 15, and 15 has been crashing a lot. It crashed like three times yesterday, so it's I like, uh, it's really like it's it's very badly optimized, and it's struggling to, to, to do anything, but I, I have no game plan for after this, so like, I don't know, maybe Fine, Witcher, fuck but... No, fuck it, fuck it, you're going to stream Divinity. Maybe. You're gonna play Divinity and you're gonna stream it. Maybe by the time I'm done, uh, Cyberpunk is out. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, that is coming out in a month. Yeah, and Be nut for me, dog. But also, don't make your fucking workers make overtime, even though you said you weren't gonna make them work overtime, and then now you're like overtime, lol. It's so, so like add on to the crunch. Uh, at the very least, because I mean, I at least assume this is still the case. I would be very surprised if not. They're still based in Poland, correct? Uh, Larian? No, 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 no. Uh, Project uh, CD Red. Oh, yeah. CD Project Red, yes. They are in uh, Warsaw. Yeah. So, at the very least, because, like, the average income in Poland is, like, 200 bucks a month. So, I assume that CD Project Red actually pr pays them proper wages because they're making hella money off of the Witcher series. So, at the very least, even if they're doing crunch... I hope that most slash not if not all workers are very well taken care of and they don't have to worry about, you know, anything in life as far as finances go. You are bringing up a very interesting point uh, regarding that, because for those who don't know, there was a recent news break. Uh, obviously, all the news in the gaming world right now is that Punk uh, 7 is coming up for 19th. Like everybody has that date beat into their heads now. Everybody's talking about, you know, are we going to have the PCs for it and everything? But there's not a lot of, there is news, but people don't really seem to pay much attention because CD Projekt Red is such a beloved company. Uh, they just had a news release earlier um, within the last week talking about crunch at CD Projekt Red. And they are known crunch for, for their crunch time. They aren't necessarily as evil about it as, say, you know, other companies such as Electronic Arts or the other big name ones that you hear about in the news all the time. But, 
you know, as beloved as CD Projekt Red is, you know, right now, a month out, they're crunching. Um, and I assume it's probably quality assurance at this point, uh, you know, trying to put any remaining bugs, but they're all hands on deck and it's mandatory too. It isn't optional. They're actually saying pretty much if you want to work here, you have to contribute to the crunch, but they are compensating them. For so that's where the line kind of, you know, that, that, that that's where the path sort of forks in the road from, you know, these other companies where it's just expected of you to work, you know, 60, 70 hours a week. CD Projekt Red is at least saying, hey, you have to do this, but we are going to compensate you appropriately for it. Does that make it acceptable for you guys to hear that? Or do or is crunch just an unethical thing all around that you think should just be abolished entirely in the industry and people need to you know start unionizing or you know what's your guys's approach when when you hear that about a company as beloved as cd project red so um we touched a little bit a little bit on this uh last podcast um but uh, my theory my 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 thoughts about it was just like crunch is kind of inevitable it, it happens to me specifically because I work my, my day job is in a corporate world. And so I get crunched very often and uh, you, you do it because it's your job and all that other stuff and you're compensated and it's, that's kind of like the thing. Um, so do I think crunching is unethical? No. However, what I did have an issue with was that CD project red um, approached a lot of project managers and people that were working um, for other companies and they basically promised like, hey, we'll never ask you to ever do a crunch. And so a lot of that was an incentive for those people to be hired by them. And so they were like, okay, yeah, I'm going to go work for this company because I don't want to do the game crunch anymore. But then now they're like, oh, just kidding. Everybody's going to crunch anyways. <laughs> and like for me, that's that's not an integrity. And that's what I don't like about it. Is crunching wrong and unethical? Uh, I mean, I live it in... I don't necessarily feel any kind of way about it, but I'm also, I would say I'm a little bit like a workaholic. So um, I can't, I can neither confirm nor deny that aspect. But what I don't like about it is the fact that they went and they, they basically headhunted from other companies, promised them this carrot of like, Hey, you'll never have to work crunches again. And now they're slamming down crunches anyways. That's fucked up. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the fact that they're being hypocrites is fucked up. I personally do think crunch is unethical. Uh, I think it just stems from the fact that uh, companies set, uh, you know, um, unrealistic, unrealistic deadlines for maximum profit and then push it off on the, you know, the average Joe in the company so they can fill their pockets. So I think it's very unethical. Um, I think crunch shouldn't be abolished, but it should be an optional kind of thing where it just becomes over time. Like if you put in more hours than... You know, if, let's say if you're if you're working 40 hours, but if you put in 50 or 60, I think you should just be fairly compensated for that. And um, that's how I see it. Mandatory crunch. Well, I get it, uh, especially right as you know, November is very ripe for gaming with holiday season and stuff like that. Um, it is not good. Uh, like there's people like you, you always hear the stories, right? People sleeping at the office. Uh, maybe they're working like 20 hours and like napping under their desk for a couple of hours like it's, it's bad for both your physical and mental health because uh, typically, like, you know, it's, it's not like they're going to be done. Like once once Cyberpunk gets shipped, it's not like, OK, everybody, we're done. Go home, have a vacation for three months. Like, no, it's like then you turn around and like, let, oh, they, they found a thousand bugs. Let's get right on to fixing them as soon as possible. Or let's let's start working on DLC or the next project or there's always something to do. Um, so, and you just don't ever really get the time to like live your life, you know? So I think crunch at its core is unethical and the approach to it should be changed, but I don't think we can ever abolish it out of video games is like a multi-billion, you know, dollar um, money-making industry, you know? Like there's no way people at the top are just going to be like, oh yeah, like let's not crunch and delay our game by six months. Like, hmm. That's never going to happen ever, you know, because if it does, if a company just genuinely does that, then another company is just who does do crunch. It's just going to beat you to it and probably, you know, get more profit because of it. Yeah, that's capitalism. I mean, yeah. so for me, it really I guess it just boils down to compensation. 
uh, you know, a lot of companies, the big name ones, the AAA companies out there, and which I would consider CG Project Red at this point a AAA company. They they own good old games. You know, they put out. You know, they they have a mass. They have probably the most one of the most successful franchises in video game history. You know, so I, I would consider them a AAA industry. But most of them, you hear, they will hire their employees on salary at a fixed rate and then just make them crunch and show no compensation. It sounds like CD Projekt Red is either, you know, they, it sounds like they, they aren't taking that approach. I, I don't know if, if if they're paying them hourly or if they're just, in, you know, incentivizing them with bonuses, but it really does come down to compensation. If, if CD Projekt Red just told everyone, here's your blanket salary, you know, take it or leave it. We're gonna crunch the, the hell out of you and make you hate your life. No, that's evil. That's that's like electronic arts evil. That's that's not good. But at least they are willing to compensate for it. So the employees have the option of accepting the increased payload at, at a higher rate, or potentially, you know, it, it's it's not good to think about right now with everything. But you know, the, they at least have the option, uh, and they can take it or leave it as insensitive as, 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 as that may come off, but at least they are incentivizing them with with proper compensation it sounds like yeah i mean i i don't know but i assume so right i assume they're not paying them poland wages and increasing the company's profit margin more because of that because i also assume that uh, a lot of people work um out of the country right? i'm sure a lot of dev developers don't want to move to warsaw to to work for CD Projekt Red, but they do want to work for them, so they just work from home somewhere in the United States or wherever, right? Yeah, yeah. And I guess a final note here, I don't want to harbor too long on this because it sounds like you guys already discussed this, but just as a, as a small plug, and I'm not in any way affiliated with this, but if anyone ever wants to get a detailed look at how CD Projekt Red works, there's an excellent documentary, behind the scenes documentary on the Witcher series uh, from them by the channel Noclip multiple parts it's it's hours long in total but there's multiple it's broken up into multiple parts that detail it and it gives you a fascinating insight in, into how they into how they work and how they made one of the most successful games in, in all of history so i would highly recommend that for anyone that's curious yeah um the link to that will be in the description down below uh for anyone that's interested in uh in viewing that after this um although with, with that Sort of a little, a little bit of a sour note, but it uh, it happens, right? We can always end on a good note. I think uh, th I think we're done here for today. So uh, so first of all, Scott, uh, thank you for for coming. Thank you for being here. Thank you for vibing with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was this was really enjoyable. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you could be here. Uh, who knows? Like maybe maybe we'll be back in the future if you're uh, if you're down for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see what happens. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited by that. But yeah, um, I'm I'm one of your hosts, Milan, signing off. And I'm Kelly Finger Guns. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Tell me if you play Switch on the fucking subway. Have a good night, everyone. All right, take care. <laughs>